Thank you. Welcome, everyone. This is Drake Barakas, Chair of the National Linux Society, uh, bringing you another special NHS Talk Stories. And uh, appropriate when we talk stories, we have a, a wonderful American author with us, Gregory McGuire, who will tell us about his life history and his Greek connection. And uh, we'll, we'll take it from the beginning to the end, so to speak, uh, in his life. And uh, I, I had a chance to uh, meet Greg a couple years ago here in Boston through a, an organization called The Examine Life. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, as we go through the process. But anyway, Gregory, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'd love to, love to hear your story. Well, thank you, Drake. It's a, it's a pleasure to be, uh, well, let's face it, it's a, it's a pleasure to be addressing anyone these days. It's a pleasure to be alive and still have a functioning mouth and a functioning story. Uh, so it's, a, it's nice to see you again, too. And thank you for this invitation. Hello to Oh, everybody. our pleasure. Thank you. And uh, I think our audience, when they get a chance to see this, will, uh, will really appreciate, because uh, your story is very personal. And uh, it, uh, it, what we found is unique, not only for, for a lot of, uh, um, you know, immigrants that came over, let's say, from Greece, like for, in my example, my grandparents, all my grandparents, but uh, certainly folks like yourself that were born as a Greek-American and uh, you know, we'll talk about finding your identity and influences and things of that nature. So, so let's start. Let's sure. start from the beginning. So tell us a little bit about uh, where you were born, your, your family, kind of your early life. I know, unfortunately, you had a little bit of a tragedy. And tell us about you know, just the basic family structure. Yes. I, am, I, I have to say first, I'm so happy to be welcomed into the life of Greek Americans and into the life of Greeks, especially with a person who is saddled with the last name of McGuire. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, uh, my father uh, was Irish American. My father was Irish from Ireland. Uh, and um, what is less easy to tell is that my mother was Greek. She was either born in Greece in 1915, or she was maybe um, born on the boat coming over sometime between 15 and 17, or she was born, you know, when she got here. It, it's, those details are all lost to history uh, for a number of reasons. One is that the family was very poor. How they actually got uh, the mother, father, and at least, at least one other child, how they actually afforded to, to come by steamer in 1915 or 16 or 17 to the United States is kind of a mystery because they were poor basically their whole lives in America. My grandfather was from Thessaloniki, and so was his wife. Uh, his name was Grigoriou, Stefanos Grigoriou, and her name was Ephemia Masco Grigoriou. They somehow, they came to Albany, New York. They went to Albany, New York, I suppose I should say. And uh, uh, they had seven children. Uh, by my, my mother was the second or third. Now you might say, why is he, this is his family, why is he, why is he so inept at knowing the details of, I mean, just only one generation back. Come on. Right. Uh, don't you care about it? But the thing is, my grandmother died in a hospital fire in the uh, early or mid-20s, leaving seven children, including my Aunt Sophia, who was only dead a year now at the age of 95. Uh, seven children basically to raise themselves while their Greek father who never learned much English, a kind of was at sea. He, he worked in a restaurant, he was a cook. Some people say he owned the restaurant, other people said, no, he was the cook. <laughs> he didn't own it. Uh, but he had five marriageable daughters. It was a little bit like Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof. He had five Greek American daughters, each one a beauty, each one more beautiful than the one before, no matter which way you looked, very fairy tale like but he couldn't really control them. Uh, and he was, um, uh, they threw themselves into being American. They threw themselves into uh, speaking English, into being American girls, going to high school. Here's a picture of my mother, Helen, who was the second or third. Here she is when, during the depression, when she's about, oh, I don't know, 10 maybe? Yep. Late 1920s. And here she is uh, about high school graduation. Sure. A classic Greek beauty. Her name was Eleni, or, or Helen. Eleni Gregorio, Helen Gregory. The, the name was Americanized. So my last name, Gregory, 
my first name, Gregory, comes from her maiden name. So my name, Gregory McGuire, as my author's name and my, my real name, is both my father and my mother, my Greek and my Irish heritage, and they match in me. Now, the reason I don't know any more about this is that my father and she married just at the end of the war in the, in the 40s, and uh, 45 or so. And in 1954, I was their fourth child, uh, born in Albany, New York, and she died in childbirth when I was born. So my father, just like her family, my father was saddled with a family of motherless children, second time in the family's story in two generations. And he uh, dispensed us for a while to her Greek sisters, her Greek American sisters. And eventually I ended up in an orphanage, a uh, Catholic orphanage in Albany, while my father tried to see if he could pull his life together and survive a heart attack that he'd had after this tragedy. He was unemployed. So four children, no job, no wife. Um, bright man, but neither my father or mother ever got out of high school or ever got beyond high school. Uh, eventually he did decide he was going to live and he lived, you know, another 38 years or so. He, uh, he got married to my birth mother's best friend from grade school. My, my second mother, as we called her, not a stepmother, second mother. My second mother was the daughter of Irish immigrants. Her name was Marie. And she had known Helen for 10 or 15 years longer than my father and Helen ever knew each other. So when my father asked her to get married, she was in her late 30s. Uh, she already knew all four children. She was actually the godmother of, of me and, and, and Auntie Marie to the other kids. It was pretty easy for her to be folded into the family and for her to take over, take charge. She got the car keys. She drove the family bus for the rest of her life. And she died at 95 about eight years ago. My father died uh, much earlier. Uh, so I have, t I have both a Greek heritage, an invisible, evanescent, magical, the kind of, the, 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 the heritage of myth more than the heritage of actual facts, which is why I can't tell, I can't answer questions about why did they come to Albany or how did she decide to marry my father? Any of those things a young man might ask his mother or his father uh, if he was talking to them <laughs> about their back. So fast forward to me at the age of about 20. Uh, this is 74, roughly. I decide to go to Greece for the first time. Nobody in my family uh, in Albany, or my aunts and uncles, if they knew a little Greek, they didn't share it. I didn't grow up speaking Greek. I didn't grow up uh, eating Greek food. We were Irish Catholics and pretty much remain so. Uh, but the, the absent mother, which is an element in so many fairy tales, so many Grimm's tales, you know, every single fairy tale starts with the mother dying in childbirth and the child having to make his or her way uh, on, on their path alone. Uh, the absent mother in my life was a big mystery and I wanted very much to, con if I couldn't connect with her, I wanted to connect with the world from which her family had come. So 1974, one of my older brothers and I went to Northern Greece. We went to Athens, we went to Northern Greece. We had a street address from 22 or 24 years earlier, the last letter that had arrived from my, uh, my grandmother's only sister. She only had one sibling. Her sister had been a baby when she left. She'd never seen her again. We had a street address, Katatumba in uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, we found it. We found the address somehow with a great deal of effort and stopping and asking people in tabaks and in churches and, you know, where is this little lane? We finally found it went up to a small house with an iron gate and there's a little bell on the gate. Bring, bring, bring. We rang it. An old woman, old as she seemed to me, <laughs> Ben, I'm almost the same age at this point, came out of this little house. She came, took two or three steps down the uh, path. She looked at us. She screamed, Americani! Ran back in the house and slammed the door. <laughs> and, but the thing is, in the, in the three seconds we had, we could see oh, it's, it's Aunt Jenny and, and Aunt Sophie, except like both of them, because she's kind of stout, <laughs> but she's got the family face. It, she's definitely, she recognized the family in our faces, even though all she had the photographs for her 70s. Sure. 
and we recognized her. The door opened again about a minute later. She came out, having stuffed her, her, her bare feet into good shoes and carrying her husband on her arm. And they processed with great uh, sobriety to open the gate and to fall upon our necks. Uh, the story of how we were integrated into the household for two or three days is very heartwarming, but I don't want to take up too much time. What I'm trying to point out is that by dint of energy and ambition and desire, I was able latterly to forge an association with my family in Greece that had basically been broken for anywhere from 25 to you know, 45 years. And following that, that moon landing, as it were, back into family history, many of my cousins and some of my aunts and uncles went back to Northern Greece and met their relative and met our cousins. And the family, uh, the family bond was reunited for the time. Sure. How many, uh, how many siblings do you have? Well, I have, I have three full, full-blown siblings. That is my oldest, my older three siblings. And my father and my second mother uh, have three more. So there are seven of us. We all have the same father. We're half brothers and sisters. But we don't generally consider ourselves as, as two halves of a, of a family. We are, seven, we are seven kids like the Von Trapp family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we... Even if we have different mothers, we recognized that our mothers were friends. And so it, so we had a more cohesive family story that we all owned uh, than I think many people who have blended families. Sure, sure. And how much, uh, how old, I guess, how old were your older siblings when, you're, when your mom passed away, when, when you were born? The oldest was eight. Okay. Uh, so they were something like eight, six, five, eight, six, four, and one, or something like that. Me. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was, the, it was the week I was born that she died. Um, and so, it, so they've had. So they've had your. I mean, any recollection they had of your mom, you know, that was the only source that you would have had, even though it was very early in their lives as well. That plus, of course, my my, my your aunts. My second mom and my father. And, and your they, aunts, yes. And they, you know, they didn't, um, they, they were very responsible. They didn't embargo stories about the first mother. They liked to share them. They wanted us to know who our family was. And my, my half-brothers and sisters, who were born of the living mother sitting at the end of the dining table, were just as interested in the Greek side of the family, too. Sure. Eventually, my, uh, my second mother began to, you know, learn to make moussaka and, and baklava and uh, I, I can't really remember the names of those nice little Greek uh, cookies with pecans and then they're sort of half moons, you know, powdered sugar, you know. Yeah, yeah, gurabiades. Yes, right, right. Uh, so so the, the, Greek, um, the Greek flavor and tone of the family was honored, even if it was done in a kind of theatrical. Sure. It's almost emblematic it's almost like a sacrificial not a sac a sacramental gesture of affection more than oh yeah this is how we always did it you know when we were little you know we invented it we created it again but i took greek all the time and i i have learned to speak a little greek and i've been there many 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 times since uh, my first visit in 74. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And your dad, was your dad born here in the States or was he right from- My dad Iowa? was born. My dad was born here in the States. He, he was, yeah. he grew up in Brooklyn. So, <laughs> so I've got uh, a little bit of, I've got a little bit of Brooklyn in my voice. If you ask me for a cup of coffee in Albany, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn speak, you'd be getting. So your grandparents were uh, from, right from Ireland? I think so. There's a little bit of murkiness on that side of the family too, you know, if you have to leave your apartment in the middle of the night because you can't pay your bills during the depression, you have seven children, you don't actually spend a lot of time packing up family heirlooms and even papers. So, uh, and my father was not all that fond of his father, so he didn't like talking about him. So there's a lot of mystery on all sides. Gee, I'm glad to be alive and to be, and to be articulate, be able to make up my own story since nobody handed me one. <laughs> so, that, so that was a perfect union then between your mom and dad, because they both had the, you know, the, I mean, and I'm sure that, you know, it, it was very common back at that time frame, the, you know, the immigrants that came over in the early 1900s and through the depression that, you know, the, the, it was, it was an escape to some sort from where they were, but they also came here during difficult times. They came depression, here. Being, yep. being, you know, becoming Americanized, being uh, discriminated against. 
to some extent, and then obviously the war's happening. So it was, it was a very difficult, challenging time. Well, it's interesting, Drake, because my, my um, grandfather is reported to have said to all his Greek daughters, who had no Greek Orthodox men to date, Albany was not, they didn't go to Boston or to DC or to New York or, play, or Lowell or places where there are large Greek populations. Why they went to Albany, I have not been able to tell, and I know I, I will never know that answer now. Maybe they had a cousin or a friend who had a job in the government or something. Uh, but my grandfather reportedly said to his five daughters, so you want to, you know, one after another, they married Irish, um, Amer Irish Catholic American men, one after the other, all five of them. And what he said to them is, as long as you marry somebody who goes to church, it doesn't matter to me if you don't go to Greek Orthodox church, you know, God bless you, you know, get married and bring your children up to be faithful. And that's, that's great. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, yeah, that's, I was going to ask you about, you know, things, key, ta I guess, takeaways or things that you've learned uh, from, from, you know, the kind of the family beliefs and so forth. And that's, that's an important lesson. Absolutely. It really is. He didn't have too much to give them. He had nothing to give them by way of money. And but he saw, and, and to some extent, he saw that the church was was a perfect place to build a family, start a family, believe in yourself, have have believe in faith, and a a absolutely. And indeed, uh, if you if you take graph paper and begin to chart the attributes of one uh, Christian faith system next to another, uh, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room. You know, you believe in the basics and you use them as a guide for making sound moral decisions and ethical decisions uh, through the rest of your life. And which flavor of ice cream you get, it's almost, almost <laughs> accidental. Right. I'm not saying there aren't important reasons to be one or the other, um, but, what they're basic, but basically what you're getting is a family language. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language of ethics, I think, and a language of also story because faiths are story systems as well as ethical systems. Right, and really until you were 20 years old in 1974 and actually made the, the familiar connection in the motherland, I mean, everything, because you, as you said, you weren't in a predominant Greek-American community. Um, you grew up Irish Catholic. Uh, you, obviously, you had a Greek side of the family. But like, I think, again, like most, including my own, you know, grandparents that came over here, you know, they really was... A, a, you know, there was a reason why they came over here, and there was as much as they loved their homeland and, and, and would love to go back, they couldn't afford to go back. And so they, 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 they were well established and entrenched here. Did and they so they, they wanted to start their families here. Did they ever get to go back? Well, I, actually, my paternal grandfather did go back because yeah. he, was, he wasn't an American citizen yet. He went back and fought in the uh, Balkan Wars uh, before World War I. Right, right. So he... Um, he actually did go back, um, but at that, again, he, this was before he was married. He met my grandmother here. She had come over, um, and then my other grandparents came over a little later. But no, they never, they really never went back until they established themselves and, um, you know, built up their families here, uh, you know, kept in touch as best as they could. But it was, at that point, they were American, and, uh, you know, they, when, when they could afford to go back, you know, I remember my my, mater, my paternal grandmother. I think she went back to Greece once, or maybe twice, uh, that I recall. Uh, but she had, you know, all, her sisters were all here. Her brother was here. So I mean, uh, the ones that all the family came over, there was really no reason for them to go back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that that that's true. And uh, and now my associations with Greece are are invented and constructed, but they take the place of family structure. Um, in a lot of ways. So I have associations with, for instance, the American Farm School in um, Perotis College in Thessaloniki because it's on the outside yep. of where my family's from. And I have, uh, I have funded a Gregory Maguire Writing Center for the high schoolers there. Uh, uh, and uh, I've also been very happy to be the nominee for the Nation of Greece uh, for an international award, uh, the highest award given to writers of children's books and encouragers of literacy. I was nominated twice by the Nation of Greece. I didn't get it either time, but I was there. I was there That's nominee, and I'm quite an honor with a name like McGuire. I am. Um, <laughs> I, I, I sound. I sound like an apologist for myself, and I suppose I am. If I had, if I had been thoughtful about it, and if I did, hadn't thought it would hurt my father's feelings. 
I would probably have chosen to have a, a nom de plume of, with a Greek name. I, I, might, <laughs> I might have used my middle name and I might have called myself Peter Gregory or, or something like that after my mother's last name. But I didn't have much warmth for my father at that age. And I, I, but I also didn't have any, any desire to hurt him. So I didn't want to shuck his name aside. And that's the name I got. So let's talk about you now. How, uh, you know, was writing uh, a passion? Was it something that you picked up uh, as a student uh, along the way? And when, when did, you know, what, what influenced you, I guess, to some extent? And tell us a little bit. I know you went to school here locally at, in Tufts. Yes. Uh, undergrad and grad. And you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I, as, as, as you know, I have six siblings. And we were not, what, we were not prosperous family. We weren't, as, we weren't in as much... Um, trouble as say the generation directly above but we my father was a journalist after after my mother died he kind of got his act together and got a job at the local paper and began to turn in copy for human interest stories science stories and, and, and comic pieces uh, by the time I really became aware of what he was and what he was doing he was known locally as a man about town a raconteur a journalist and a and a humorous columnists, sort of like Dave Barry, only not so funny and not, um, you know, not read all over the country. But he was a local humorous columnist, man about town, occasionally on TV, a little public figure. But it's hard to raise seven kids on, uh, you know, the money that a journalist makes. Uh, so we had to make ends meet. And we had, we didn't have new clothes, you know, pretty much till we were out of college. Um, goodwill and hand-me-downs from cousins and things like that were how, how we lived. Uh, my second mother was intensely frugal and very good with a, with a penny. And she, she managed to find ways to keep us all fed, both, uh, but it wasn't easy. So I, all through our growing up times, my parents said, the only thing you, the only thing you guys have going for you is your native smarts. You know, you, you guess your father and your mother may not have gotten out of school. They were, they, your dad is very smart. He's a self-made man. Your mother was very smart. You know, I, your second mother, am very smart. I got my two degrees, um, or three, whatever they were. And, and this is what we have to give you. This is our inheritance to you. We are telling you, get the degree. Get the diploma. No, we can't afford to send you to college. You'll have to get scholarships. Go do it. And, you know five and a half of the seven of us went and got went to school on scholarships. We were lucky. We did have the inheritance of brains and ambition. And we had a little bit of fear of poverty in us because we knew our shoes were down at the heel compared to lots of other families up and down the block. Uh, so my parents said, you want to go to law? Law school, we'll find the money. We'll take out a second or third mortgage. You want to go to med school, we'll find the money. Everything else you have to pay for yourself. They wanted us to be professional people because they wanted us to be comfortable and they wanted us to be secure. What did we do instead? Five of the seven of us became professional writers. <laughs> we, followed, we followed my parents and their love of language, their love of storytelling, their love of words and etymology we didn't take their advice about becoming professional people, but we took their advice about how to live a life that was full of, of savor and full of um, flavor and, and, and dignity and delight. So I have a number of brothers who are writers. I'm the only fiction writer in the family, but I began writing when I was a kid. I began when I was five or six years old, Drake, because partly because my parents were strict. They were kind of very strict because uh, the death of my mother when I was born was the only crisis and trauma they wanted to go through for the rest of their lives. So they kept a very firm 19th century sort of reign on their children. We weren't allowed to cross the street till we were about in middle school without permission. We weren't allowed to ride bicycles until we were 16 and had passed the New York State driver's license exam. We had to be legally allowed to drive a car before we could get on a two-wheeler bike. They were terrified for us. The advantage of this, the disadvantage is obvious, we might have all gone start raving mad, but the advantage was 
that in order to keep ourselves emotionally and intellectually supple, we threw ourselves into reading and the library, and we threw ourselves into creative work, into making up stories and drawings and plays and writing music. And we were, again, the joke about the Von Trapp family or about the Partridge family or about the Bronte children stuck in that parsonage up on the moors of Yorkshire, we had nothing to fall back on but the strength of our own imaginations and that very boredom and lack of opportunity is, I think, what taught me how to be a writer because I learned the skills of industry and focus by the time I was 10. That's fascinating. That's very fascinating. And so you honed your skills while you were in uh, college and I, high I wrote, school and college? I wrote, I wrote hundreds of stories between the ages of, say, 8 and 18. Did you ever read... Um, that book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. No, I have not. It's a, it's a great piece. It's, it's a story. Now, I'm not setting myself up to be in the same category, but it's a story about how certain people who make incredible contributions, like, say, the Beatles, or like, say, Bill Gates, or like, say, Einstein, um, about people who make incredible contributions to the world often have been in the, an unusual situation of having been able to put in 10,000 hours of apprenticeship while they were still young. The Beatles did it because they went to Germany to be one of two bands uh, playing for a couple of years and the other band never showed up. So they played twice as much as any other band of their age during those formative years while they were still young. Bill Gates dropped out of, uh, then never went to college but his parents had access to computer equipment. They let him set up in the garage and they let him go to school and they funded his playing around with computers. And by the time he was 18 or 20 or 21, he had spent 10,000 hours in his own apprenticeship under his own tutelage. And while I don't put myself you know, as a Google or as Bill Gates, I too spent about 10,000 hours. I actually kind of worked it out how often how many books I wrote when I was a kid. I just, I, I gave myself my own training so that by the time I was in college, by the time I was a sophomore in college, I had my first idea for my first book and it was published a year after I got out of college. That's very young. It was published when I was 24. Um, but it wasn't that young because I'd been working since, since I was eight <laughs> in a way. You know, I'd, I'd graduated into, into my... Uh, into my apprenticeship, from my apprenticeship status into being a kind of workman uh, by the time I was out of college. And was the, was the, and was the focus always geared towards children's literature or did that develop over time? It, my first book was a children's book, although at the time that I wrote it, I didn't actually even realize that. I thought of it as a book with a child protagonist like Catcher in the Rye or A Tree Girls in Brooklyn. In actual fact, once I started sending it out to publishers, uh, people would say, oh, we sent this to the children's department. It's a children's book. And that's how I, it, the kind of scales fell from my eyes. But it makes sense that it would be a children's book because I was still basically a child myself. Certainly had, you know, had not lived any adult life at the time I was 24. Uh, and so my first six years of, of being published were all children's books. It wasn't until I was in my late 30s when I wrote Wicked, which was my first novel for adults, that I actually did two things. I, I wrote for adults, <laughs> three things. I wrote for adults, I wrote a successful novel, and I started to become uh, a, prof a real professional, that is a person who actually could earn his living uh, with his skill. And I also started to develop a, uh, a, a reputation as, as an individual on the planet, you know. So how did the Wicked story come, come to be? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, wa I was living in London at the time, in the early 1990s, and the, uh, the first Gulf War had started. And I began to notice in the British papers the headlines, Saddam Hussein, the next Hitler. And I remember just thinking, just the application of that one word, Hitler, made my blood run cold. And I, I started, you know, divorcing this from the political question of when is, what are St. Paul's uh, standards for an ethical war. Uh, leaving that aside, 
I just was interested in how powerful words are and that if we call somebody a Nazi or a Hitler, we use words like that, we do two things. We empower ourselves by giving ourselves a moral superiority and we dehumanize the people that we are um, chastising. We do this actually for, I think, a, a kind of an animal reason. If we need to fight somebody in order to ensure that, that our cause is just, we have to make our enemy less than human. We have to say we are more worthy to live than that person, our enemy. Uh, this has been true for as long, you know, Cain and Abel, basically, were worried about that themselves. Uh, so I began to think about this, and I began to think about how we use words like villain or evil to tarnish the people we're up against and to make it easier for us to attack them. And at the same time, Drake, there was a terribly sad story, and I won't go into too much, but I bet you remember it, about a small boy who wandered away from his mother's apron strings in a supermarket in early, um, the early 1990s. And his, he was two years old. He got lost. His body was found a day later, having been murdered, having been basically stoned to death and left on railroad tracks. Uh, it was discovered after the examination of security cameras that his kidnappers and his murderers were not men or a man, but boys, schoolboys who'd been playing hooky. They were nine and 14 or 11 and 14. Uh, they were identified. The laws of England did not require that their identities be secret. They have changed since because of this case, but at the time their faces and their names and their family histories were plastered all over the pages as the nation mourned for this beautiful two-year-old, uh, Jamie Bulger was his name. I looked at this and like everybody, I thought, how could an 11 year old and a 14 year old get up in the morning, choose which cereal to have, decide on their way to school they were gonna play hooky and become murderers by the evening? This is, this is a basic human question. How do we choose to do bad or how do we become bad or have we always been bad and we've just been waiting for the opportunity for it to have a chance to show itself? These are basically pretty unanswerable questions, I do believe. But to ask them is, is an important job of all adults and even of children, I think. So I thought, my head is going to explode if I don't write this, if I don't examine this, this moral question. What if, I'm a, what if I'm a potential axe murderer and I don't even know it? You know, I want to protect the world from myself. I have to ask an intellectual question. What is the nature of evil? And I have to do it in a way I can understand. Up till then, I had studied children's books. I was teaching at Simmons College here in Boston. I had taken a master's at, at Simmons. And I, was, I, was, I had actually taken a doctorate at Tufts in, uh, in child, with a dissertation in children's fantasy. So everybody always says about writing, oh, write what you know. Well, I couldn't write about poor people in Thessaloniki. <laughs> I didn't really know that. I just that invented it kind of fantasized about it. But I did know children's books. So I began to think, well, I can't really use children's books because there are no villains in children's stories, no real villains. And then suddenly I had the inspiration of my lifetime. Out of the clouds came a vision. And it wasn't the Virgin Mary or Panayiamu, which I've been expecting most of my life. It was the Wicked Witch of the West. And she was saying, I'll get you and your little dog. And I thought, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I've just had a vision. Everybody knows who the Wicked Witch of the West is. Everybody in the whole world knows who she is. And nobody knows a thing about her because the author of The Wizard of Oz didn't give her a backstory, nor did the 1939 film that made her a universal figure. So I thought, she's perfect for me. I can examine her life and decide how and in what ways she might or might not have been wicked I mean, gee, it's even in her name, the Wicked Witch of the West. I want to write about being evil and how we use the naming of people being evil as a tool against them and as a tool in our own defense. So there, that was my big inspiration. I was 38 years old. My brain had finally started to fizz and to come together the way it's supposed to do for young men about that age. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a big success right away, and I have never looked back. Why did it success? You're being <laughs> modest. <laughs>
you know, if you're if you're used to not even being able to buy three hamburgers on the on the income from of one course. year of book sales, then, then to actually to say I don't actually have to go to get another job, um, I have enough money coming in to um, you know to earn my living. Then, uh, as it happened, this veers into family story again. I looked back at what my two mothers had given me. I looked back at the life that my birth mother had given me and what she had sacrificed without necessarily intending to do so, but she had sacrificed her life in order to bring me into the world. And I also looked at the life that my second mother had given me by taking me and my brothers and sisters on and raising us up as her own. And I thought to myself, how do I, how do I redress the moral debt that I owe to these good people? Um, uh, one way I have, one way we all have of thanking our parents for what they gave us and our grandparents and our great grandparents who made that arduous trek from the homeland. One way we have of thanking them and honoring them is to live good, full, worthy lives. That is an act of homage, I believe, to those who brought us where we are. And I consider that very seriously. But for myself too, I thought, I wanted, I wanted to do something else. So I adopted three children. I adopted two boys with my partner. I adopted two boys and a girl. And I gave them the parents that they didn't have in the same way I was given parents or at least a mother that was denied me. And this, uh, this, it sounds sappy and sentimental, but it is the best thing I've ever done with my life. Better than writing a, a, a book that becomes, you know, a famous Broadway play and, and makes me comfortable and able to give back. The best thing that I've done is to honor my parents and their contributions to my life. And my grandparents have traveled from Ireland or from Greece by giving the wealth of their heart forward to people who needed it. And that's a legacy. That's exactly what it is, right? I think so. It's a, it's a legacy. For, it's, a, it's a legacy from the heart. It's a legacy from the heart. And you know, my three kids, uh, two, the two boys are from Cambodia. And the little girl, who's not so little anymore, is from Guatemala. They all have Greek names. Their names are Luke, Alexander, and Helen. And so they, they, they're part Greek too. Well, their skin is Asian and Central American, Hispanic. And, and, but they're, they're part Greek too. And they know it. Just as a, this is a, 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 this is <laughs> this is just a little bit off the script, but I'm, I, I know this could be a conversation for for a whole other topic. But right. um, you're seeing a lot of things in the news lately about uh, stripping away the classics. Or the other day was Shakespeare. Um, what, what's kind of your thought on? And of course, this you know, listen, generations and history changes over time, and. Yeah. Nobody's always, you know, a great character, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we're our world and lifetime uh, and our history is full of, of, of good and bad um, and, you know, wars and power and, and control and so forth. But, you know, we, again, we try to focus on the, on the positives that, that made us who we are today. Um, but I'm curious, just from your perspective as, a, as an author, as a writer, um, as an educator, you know, does, how, does, how does that, I guess, feel with you and your community, your, your you know, educational writer community, that hearing that, geez, you know, people are questioning now whether we should de-emphasize some of the classics or, you know, Shakespeare should be, you know, banished, let's say. Yes, and I've, I've seen the same thing said about Homer and, uh, oh, and, yes. various, uh, and various classic authors. And this brings me around to uh, another feather in my cap, that organization through which we met Drake called the Examine Life Greek Studies in the Schools. A good friend and colleague of mine began this 25 years ago, I guess, and I've been part of it for about 15. Uh, this small organization that uh, brings teachers through some of the classics and the, uh, the, the uh, knowledge of philosophy, the knowledge of rhetoric, the knowledge of language, the knowledge of the Greek arts and of Greek history finally culminates in taking groups of 25 to 30 teachers to Greece every spring, except for last year and this year, uh, to study uh, 
what, uh, what they can of Greece. This group has grappled with some of these questions because these educators live and work with children of all kinds of scales of interest and of native or domestic background information. A lot of kids in, um, in school systems where even getting the basics uh, is, is a real hassle. So the question is always raised, what is it that the contributions of the past still have to offer us? And is this contribution at threat? Is it outdated? Is it archaic? Ought we try to root it up like the, um, you know, the loose strife that comes on the banks of the river and keep the riverbanks free for the new and the novel? Well, I'll tell you, my feeling about it is the riverbanks are endlessly re replenishing themselves and there is no way to halt the new and the novel. But also, there is no way and no reason to root out that which has nourished us so far. Yes, we can learn from the fact that cultural ideas about what's appropriate have changed, but without being able to see what the changes have been, we have no way of learning how we might change further. And I believe, therefore, that there, there should be no throwing out of Shakespeare and Homer. Look, Shakespeare and Homer and all the rest were great storytellers. They plundered from the past. They took from their own traditions. If they thought there was somebody coming down the river who had a good story to tell, they wouldn't say, I've got this riverway covered, you know, block up and go home. No, they'd say, make way, make way for the new story. Tell us what you have to tell us and we'll tell you what we have to tell you. There's no shortage of ear space to learn from the voices in human history, either in the past or those to come. Very well said. And thank you for that. I know that's a little bit off script, but thank you. I'm, I'm curious what, well, we have you uh, with us uh, to get your personal perspective. Um, giving back, obviously you've given back in a number of ways. Your, as you said, your, your family legacy, um, kind of completing that circle of, of, of being the parent that, that you want to be um, and seeing the sacrifices made behind you um, and, and making sure that you have, uh, you know, strong children and raising strong, you know, good, solid human beings. Right. Um, and also you're giving back, you know, a number of organizations. Examined Life is a big one, as you said. Um, when did that, I guess, and you mentioned your first trip to Greece was when you were in your 20 years old, 1974. Subsequent trips to Greece, how did that, I guess, mold or frame your life, so to speak? Um, obviously, the first one was more of a, you know, a, a cultural shock to some extent. Uh, but also a lot of curiosity in terms of who your family was. But, you know, how did the, how did it eventually get to the American farm school? How did you get involved with the examined life? How did that kind of matriculate through your life? Well, when I, when I came, when, before I went to Greece in 74, I, I spent about a half a year teaching myself the Greek alphabet. Even though I knew I wouldn't actually learn to speak Greek, I did want to be able to sound out there and make signs and things like that. That was a very, important thing to do, even though I'm still a little clumsy at it, and there are a couple of letters I always get backwards. <laughs> but uh, but I, can, I can read a little Greek. And uh, after my first couple of trips, I began to realize that when I arrived in Athens International Airport, I always felt like I was coming home in a way that I love, I have, a, I have a home in France right now. I love Italy. I, I lived in England for five years. I've lived in Ireland. But coming home to Greece uh, has a deeper resonance for me, partly, I suppose, because it represents to me that alternate childhood and family life that I might have had that I didn't have. So again, it's a little bit made up, but it's no less real for that. Uh, while um, I came to Boston, uh, I actually took my undergraduate work in Albany because my family couldn't afford room and board any place. So I lived in my childhood bedroom uh, in the bunk bed, went to college, <laughs> the way a lot of kids do. Uh, but I did come to school in Boston in 1977 to take a master's degree in, in children's literature at Simmons College. That's where I met Barbara Harrison, the director of The Examined Life. She was the founder and director also of uh, the Center for the Study of Children's Literature at Simmons College. She's been a lifelong educator. 
powerhouse and a quiet woman, somebody I admire as much as almost anybody else I've known in my life for having devoted her life to teachers and to the children that the teachers serve. Uh, so she's Greek. Well, of course we would have a simpatico. And I began to work uh, at the college, at, you know, after I'd been a student for a year and stayed on for eight years as, as a professor. When she began, you know, at that point, I began to go to Greece more often. And I began to recognize that arriving in Syntagma Square uh, made my heart lift. Even if mm. I didn't really have any particular friends in Greece, I just, I liked the sound of the language. I liked the street life. I liked the way that I felt at home. I liked the way that I felt a little bit off balance because to be a little bit off balance is to be alive. You know, you have to, you have to navigate. You have to negotiate through life. If you always know where you're putting your feet, you're not going very far. So Greece gave me paths to walk. In the course of the examined life, uh, where when I began to work with Barbara in planning itineraries for the annual trips, I did go to Northern Greece and I met, made a very good friend in a woman named Eva Canellis, who is the wife of the current headmaster of the American Farm School. At the time, he was the headmaster of the other school in uh, Anatolia College in Thessaloniki, but he since became the American Farm School. She became an instant warm friend She's Greek American, has lived in Greece most of her adult life, uh, speaks Greek flawlessly. She introduced me to a whole bevy of Greek educators and artists and people in, at the uh, uh, Benaki Museum and all, all kinds of uh, places. And now when I go to Athens, Drake, I find I have more people to make plans to see in Athens than I do in England where I lived for five years. Wow. This is, even though they all have to speak English pretty much, but <laughs> and they do. But this is a profoundly uh, gratifying um, turn of events for me as I you know, hover at, at the age of uh, Medicare and, and <laughs> vaccination. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lovely way to to come to what is, you know, certainly not the first third or the second third of my life. How much of my life is left? Well, I don't know, none of us know. But if it's the last third of my life, what a nice, what a nice place to find myself, feeling at home in the homeland. So we usually like to do a, uh, a, a when we wrap this up before we go to final thoughts. Um, yeah do some fun stuff here, a little bit of a lightning round, but you're obviously a favorite book. I mean, you're an author, writer. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite book, favorite movie, film? Oh, okay. Well, one of, one of my favorite books, it, I'm afraid it has no Greek connection, but it's T.H. White's book called The Once and Future King. And I liked that book when I read it in high school. And I now see it sort of gave me the template for Wicked because T.H. White took the story of King Arthur and Merlin sword in the stone and all that. Uh, and he told the story again as if we didn't already know it. He made it so interesting, the character is so compelling, that we read it all over again like it was new. And that, I realized after the fact, is, was my same aesthetic kind of template for telling the story of Wicked. Tell the story about what happened in Oz as if nobody's heard it before. And so I, I have to admire that a huge amount. Favorite movie? Uh, well, I've always, I've also, I've always, I mean, I've already mentioned uh, the sound of music twice. So I won't go there, but uh, there's a, there's a wonderful French film called Babette's Feast, which I think won the best uh, foreign film award the year that it was up. That movie is about poverty and art, poverty and, and art, uh, what we have to give up in order to make art, and what we bring to people if we put our hearts and souls into what we make. That movie is a kind of calling card, an artistic license for me to say, it's okay, Gregory, if you never went to law school. It's okay if you didn't become a doctor. You are doing the best you have with what you have, which is the ability to use your imagination to comfort, console, and challenge people who come across your way. That's all we can hope for in life, isn't it? I'm using the skill that I have to do that. And that, that movie reminds me that that's what I'm all about. 
That's wonderful. And I was going to get to that. I mean, aside from your beautiful family, what would you, anything that you haven't accomplished yet that you'd love to accomplish? Have you taken the family to Greece? Uh, you know, what, what do you want to be? I mean, what do you want to be best remembered for? These types of well, things. I did. I did take the family to Greece uh, about ten years ago. Uh, they were still they were still so small that you know I could carry them. You know, and I carried one of them up the stairs of the Acropolis. Uh, and we went to Northern Greece. We actually never did get to see my remaining relatives up there that time because a lot of them had left for Greek, for Germany, where they now live. I, I'm sure I have blood relatives there still, but not the ones that I knew best. So after all this lifetime of having been in association, now the association has frayed and they are happy memories instead of actual living experiences. Uh, so I would like to take them back though. And, and they would like to go back at some point when it's, um, when it's clear. This year, I was going to try to rent a villa for six or eight weeks in the spring of 2021. I was going to look for it in spring of 2020, rent it in spring of 2021, thinking maybe my, my kids were old enough either to join me or possibly to, you know, survive on their own while I was away for more than a week or two. Uh, of course, that wasn't to happen in the year of our corona, 2020, 2021. But I hope that that will happen soon. As to other ambitions, straight, maybe I set my bar too low, but I'm a rare person who is very calm and, and happy with what I've achieved. I don't have too many more ambitions. Of course, I don't want to do any harm. I have that ambition like a doctor. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to cause anybody any pain or suffering. But if... I mean, I say this to myself every night when I say my prayers. If the good Lord takes me tonight, I will have done with what I was given the best I could. And I think I have, um, I have honored my family and both, my, both my, my family of the past, my birth parents, and also Shakespeare and Homer. And I've brought the family of the future up to my table and fed them as best as I could while I was here. I don't know that we can ever really hope to do much more than that. And I don't think I can close any better than that. <laughs> it's Gregory, been great talking to you, Jake. Likewise, Gregory, thank you very much. I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, you know, we've, we've had several of these uh, and, and it's, it's been a, a highlight for me when I've had the opportunity to, to speak one-on-one -on -one. because what we found is, uh, you know, whether you're a 1% Greek or 100% Saint Greek, uh, you, know, you have a, a wonderful legacy, uh, a wonderful life that was created for you. Um, you've got the history that, again, uh, behind you that uh, is is remarkable. Um, in your case, it was you know putting all the puzzles of the pieces together to some extent. It wasn't a very clear path, but uh, the the fact that you've uh, you know been influenced in your life. Uh, by a number of people, you've you've kept that connection, and you, you've made the the big leap of actually going over there and finding family and and developing things and uh, bringing it full circle to giving back to your own children and making sure that they have lives of their own. And uh, and, and you've uh, certainly you're a true testament of of someone that uh, didn't necessarily grow up uh, as a Greek American as a lot of us did, but uh, you had those strong influences around you and you had that curiosity to, to find out more. And unfortunately, it probably had to be somewhat tragic, I guess, at the beginning in order to kind of pique your interest to, to, to learn more and, uh, and look where it's brought you today. So again, thank you on behalf of the National Hellenic Society and the National Hellenic Museum, who we partner with on these, uh, these personal stories, uh, our oral history stories. We thank you very much, Gregory McGuire, and look forward to seeing you in person. My pleasure, Blake. I look for uh, Drake, I look forward to seeing you as well. And uh, on that note, uh, blessings, to, blessings to all. Keep safe, keep well, and keep it in your heart. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs>